Um, now, if we look at the pathophysiological mechanisms, and I'm, I know that this for many is sort of uh, whew, very difficult, and I, I certainly understand this, but I think it's important to have an idea of what are actually the un underlying mechanisms which leads to spasticity, because that also tells you what spasticity actually signifies for the person and what we should think when we think about treatment of spasticity. Um, and I, I have to point out again here now, I'm using the term spasticity for velocity-dependent reflexes. So all the other contracture, etc. This is spasticity. So uh, one thing which is important here is that spasticity is not something which just comes on whenever you have a brain injury. Uh, so you suddenly have some kind of injury of these descending pathways but spasticity develops through several weeks, several months. So it's an adaptation in the spinal networks which are normally controlled from these indirect pathways. So actually spasticity should be seen as plasticity. It's a display of changing net networks in the spinal cord which adapt to a new situation. Basically, that adaptation is, can be seen as a lack of descending control, a lack of possibility of evoking activity in the muscles. The adaptation tries to counteract that problem by tuning up the gain of the neural networks in order to help activating the muscles again. So basically, if you don't receive sufficient input from the brain, the spinal cord increases the gain in order to help activating the muscle. This is what leads to spasticity. It is a quite sound adaptation from the spinal cord in the situation that it has been brought into when not having the normal descending control. So what are the mechanisms? There are, there are a number of control mechanisms in the spinal cord. There are lots of neural networks which change their settings uh, when uh, spasticity develops. So what I have shown here is just simply the stretch reflex. You have muscle spindles which uh, have 1A afferents which connect monosynaptically to the spinal motor neurons. So when you tap the patella you will see a stretch reflex being evoked. That's the symbol uh, stretch reflex circuitry and it's being controlled by a lot of different mechanisms. This is only some of them that I've shown here and I'm only going to uh, briefly talk about a few of them. I'm going to talk about reciprocal inhibition, which is basically the control of uh, agonist and antagonist. I'm going to talk about the intrinsic mechanisms in the alpha motor neurons, and I'm going to talk about one specific measure which we think is really closely related to the pathophysiology of uh, spasticity, which is post-activation depression. I'm going to explain what it is a little bit later on. So first of all, reciprocal inhibition. The way it works normally is that whenever we want to make a contraction, say I want to make an extension of my wrist, then my spinal cord will normally make sure that the antagonists, the flexors, are being relaxed at the same time, because if that wasn't the case, I would be evoking a stretch reflex whenever I do a wrist extension, I would be stretching my flexors, there would be a stretch reflex, the brain needs to prevent that, we have reciprocal inhibition to ensure that. So how does that look in uh, patients? Um, this is the way we can test it first of all. Uh, we can evoke a stretch reflex basically, we do it electrically using so-called H reflex and then we can stimulate the antagonist nerve and activate this reciprocal inhibition between the two muscles. This is what we measure over here. You see it in healthy subjects. 100 is when there's no change in the reflex. Whenever it goes below that, it means that we can inhibit the reflex from the antagonist. So it's a measure of the size of reciprocal inhibition. This is what it looks like in healthy subjects. And you can then see what it looks like in hemiplegic patients, paraplegic patients, patients with multiple sclerosis. Basically, it's gone, and in many of them, it's being replaced by a facilitation. So they definitely have a problem when they're sitting at rest that reciprocal inhibition don't work. And then you could say, well, who cares? They're sitting at rest, so it doesn't really matter. 
who cares if you don't have any reciprocal inhibition? One of the problems is that then you also have large stretch reflexes because reciprocal inhibition contributes to dampening the reflexes. So one contributing factor to the large stretch reflexes that you get in patients at rest is that reciprocal inhibition doesn't work. The functional significance of that, that's actually another story, which I will come back to. This is just to uh, show uh, that this is really the case. So it, it's a unique finding, I would say. It's coming from my own father, uh, who we measured him uh, some 15, 16 years ago and demonstrated a very nice reciprocal inhibition uh, in him. And uh, then he got a stroke, rather a severe stroke, but he almost fully recovered. Uh, and we measured reciprocal inhibition again. And you can see there's absolutely no reciprocal inhibition here, which fits quite nicely with uh, also his uh, increased stretch reflexes and the spasticity that he developed um, on both sides. Uh, we're going to retest him again now, uh, 10 years after study, to see if uh, things have uh, changed since then. But this is one of, I think, the rare examples where we've actually been able to measure things before and after stroke uh, to see that there is actually this change. Another property which I think is important is the response of the motor neuron to any input. So if you stretch the muscle, you have some sensory input going to the motor neurons. How do they respond to that input? And this is uh, just shown from uh, data from a study back in 1988 uh, coming from our laboratory showing that uh, motor neurons have a property so that when you put in a little input here, a uh, slight input like in a stretch reflex, some of them can actually go on for quite a long time until you make a small inhibition here. This is a spastic property. It turns out now through the experiments that we've been doing now that after a spinal cord lesion, for instance, in rats, in cats, you see that these properties are upgraded. So the receptors which are involved in this property in the motor neurons are actually being upregulated genetically uh, so that the receptors are actually being produced to an increasing extent are built into the membrane so that the membranes of spastic motor neurons are much more excitable so that when they receive just a little bit of an input they will go on with activity for a prolonged time. This is part of the uh, spastic syndrome which also has to be taken into account. So it's both inhibitory mechanisms acting on the motor neurons, it's also the motor neurons themselves that uh, react more powerfully, and it's also, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, I took it out because uh, Jakob is going to talk about it. Uh, I'm sorry, this was my mistake. Uh, I was going to introduce also the post-activation depression, uh, but I decided to take it out since uh, both Jakob and uh, uh, Maria is going to talk about it. So Jakob will have to explain what post-activation depression is a little bit more than what I'm going to do now. What, what I was going to say is that it's not only the motor neurons and the inhibitory interneurons, it's also the sensory afferents and their effects on the motor neurons which changes. So there are mechanisms which regulate how much neurotransmitter is being released from the sensory neurons synapses on the motor neurons. One of these mechanisms is post-activation depression, and it's actually changed whenever we see spasticity, this post-activation depression is diminished, and it correlates quite nicely uh, with the degree of spasticity, reflex, hyperexcitability. So it's just to illustrate that we have three different mechanisms, at least, and probably several others, which work on all different levels of the stretch reflex circuitry. It works at the presynaptic sensory level, it works at the motor neuron level, and it works at the interneuronal level. And all of them are designed to make the stretch reflex larger in, as a response to the lack of descending motor control, to help the nervous system to ensure that we still have an output uh, to um, the, the muscle 